Hello then, everybody. Good morning. Uh, welcome, everybody. So today we're going to be having a, a session, uh, follow another session on our Global Food and Environment Institute webinar series. So my name is Dr. Peter Gittins, and I'm going to be chairing this session. So we've got some Zoom etiquette here on the screen, which you can follow throughout. Um, so as our speaker is talking, can you know, please ensure that your microphone is, is muted and your camera is switched off. Um, just, just the general just the general etiquette for an online session. So I'll be chairing the session today. So my name is Dr. Peter Gittins and I'm a lecturer here at the University of Leeds. I'm a lecturer and a researcher at the business school. So that's where I'm based. I do quite a lot of research into rural contexts, mainly qualitative social science research, looking at the challenges and constraints facing farmers, farmers both in the UK and overseas. Recently just finished a, a project at the business school looking at the impact of post-Brexit policies and its impact to hill and upland farmers. So the topic today is one which very much resonates closely with me. So it's my pleasure today to welcome you all to this webinar. So we're going to be looking at this topic. So what are the needs and challenges of farmers in financial distress within the UK insolvency regime. Our speaker today is Dr. Oriana Sola, who is a lecturer in commercial and corporate and banking law, located in the School of Law right here at the University of Leeds. And before, before I hand over to the presentation itself, I'd just like to say a few words of introduction. So Oriana joined us in 2021 as a lecturer in commercial, corporate and banking law. And right now she currently teaches mostly European Union law and international corporate insolvency law. She has a PhD from the University of Leeds. So currently Oriana holds a position of programme manager for the LLM programmes in international trade law and international corporate law. And this role has allowed her to play a pivotal part in shaping the academic offer at the School of Law. Um, so I'm very much delighted to, to chair this session and I'd like, I'm delighted to welcome Oriana to this Global Food and Environment Institute session. Um, GFEI, as many of you know, is an interdisciplinary research community which brings together members of uh, members from academia, joining the humanities and sciences together, industry and public policy, all to work on the integrated challenges of food security and climate change. And of course, if you'd like to learn a little bit more about this, then check out the website leads.ac.uk forward slash global food. And of course, just a reminder, this session is being recorded and you can watch this recording later on on the YouTube channel um, and without further ado, then I will hand over to our speaker, Dr. Oriana Casola, who has roughly 20 minutes, and then we'll hold a short 10 minute question and answer session. Uh, thank you. Comes. Thank you, Peter. Um, so today um, I will talk about the needs and challenges of farmers in financial distress in England. As Peter said, my main area of expertise is research in financial distress in solvency law. Um, with this project that is funded by the Michael Beverly Innovation Fellowship, I'm looking at uh, um, the needs and challenges of uh, um, the farming sector when uh, facing financial distress. Um, so let me see. Um, just to provide a brief overview of the project, we will uh, discuss first of the presentation. Today, we'll, we'll discuss first uh, the design of the research project. I will give a brief overview of the English insolvency regimes. And 
And then I will discuss the relevance and peculiarities of the farming sector. And then we'll try to bridge, uh, to bridge the gap between the um, agricultural law and um, insolvency law. And we will try to um, see if uh, um, other countries have faced similar problem and what solution have found um, in the topic. About the research design, you can see here a um, dog he is an Italian uh, bracco. It looks for uh, truffles, so that's why it's here to indicate uh, my research um, attitude. The research question uh, looks at what are the needs of uh, farmers in financial distress in England. And to answer this question, uh, the project has adopted different methods. Uh, of course, it started from a doctrinal base. This means basically that I've been looking at literature and case law on the topic of farm and distress. Um, the <clears throat> methodology include also um, an empirical part. I have interviewed um, so far 10 insolvency, uh, 10 consult, farmer consultant that have dealt with farmers' financial distress. And uh, finally, there is a comparative element uh, in the sense that um, the project looks at uh, different uh, solutions that different countries has adopted to tackle the same problem. The identified problem is the uh, financial distress of farmers. Now, <clears throat> talking about the insolvency system in the, um, in the UK, of course, there is um, quite a lot of uh, things to say. There are uh, modules on it. So to try to condense um, the knowledge of insolvency law, uh, first, we have to clarify some terminology. Financial distress is often used to identify a, normal, a situation that happens normally, it's not a um, legal term, uh, but is the inability of the debtor uh, to pay their debts or meet their financial obligation. Now, this is the same definition of insolvency, but the insolvent status is a legal term, is a legal um, status, is a legal connotation. One, once somebody is insolvent, then they can apply to insolvency procedures. Um, how do we establish whether the debtor is insolvent? We can adopt the balance sheet test of or the cash flow test. Uh, with the balance sheet test, the assets of our debtor will be uh, lower than the liabilities, so they will not be able to cover the liability. And with the cash flow test, the, our debtor is unable to pay their debts, not because they lack assets, but because they lack cash. Um, so they are unable to pay their um, obligation as they fold you. Uh, and in clarifying this, um, I would like to give you an overview of the insolvency procedures that are available within the Insolvency Act 1986. Um, I'm not going through the specific of each uh, procedure, but I want to uh, clarify that insolvency law not only aims at closing the company, winding up the company, but also aim at rescue and restructuring a company or a debtor. Um, now, in England, we have uh, two different rules of insolvency, one for personal insolvency and one for corporate insolvency, which means that if we have a person um, acting as a sole trader or into a partnership, then um, they can apply for personal insolvency procedures. Instead, if a business carry on in a corporate, in a legal form, with a corporate form, um, then they will be able to um, apply for um, corporate procedures. The corporate procedures are uh, more structures than the personal procedure. They have the same aim. They can both liquidate and rescue um, the business, um, but the level of uh, um, complexity of the procedure changes depending uh, upon uh, which route we take. Now, for a farmer, uh, this means that if a farmer is acting as a sole trader by himself, uh, then he will have to access um, personal insolvency procedures. Instead, if, uh, um, and similarly, if the farmers uh, act in a limited partnership, which is the most, uh, sorry, in a partnership, which is the most common um, form of uh, uh, farming business. Uh, instead, if the farming is organized in a 
limited company, for example, they can, um, the farmers will be able to um, access uh, corporate insolvency procedures. Now, why the farming sector um, is so important? Um, well, on the first uh, step, the first thing that comes to mind is that it's a base of the food supply chain. So farmers feed us all. Uh, if we don't have farmers, uh, we don't have food. Uh, but um, the relevance of the farming sector goes beyond that. It, this relevance is often encompassed under the name of multifunctionality of the farming enterprise, which in simple words means that a farm uh, has multiple function, has different function. They not only produce food, but also um, manage the water in the land, um, foster biodiversity, um, look after the a sustainable management of the land. So there are different function in a farm, not just the one of um, raising animal or um, crops. Um, because of this uh, multifunctionality, it is really relevant that we um, protect the sector from um, unnecessarily insolvency. We don't want to lose um, businesses that actually contribute to the maintenance of the land, of the water, and uh, stuff like this. And we don't want to uh, lose the expertise the farmers have in, um, in managing these aspects. Um, also, uh, the farming sector is quite peculiar because it works on an um, inelastic demand. This means that if the prices of the goods, uh, if the demand of the goods goes increases, uh, the price will not increase that much. So there is not a higher um, income, there is not an increased income for farmers if the demand increases. Uh, similar, uh, the farming sector has specific uh, risk. For example, they have to deal with biological cycle of the crops. They may be pests that affect the uh, successful of the harvest, uh, similar for livestock. And also uh, there is the seasonal risk, the climatic risk. Uh, so especially with the uh, um, climate change and global warming, this uh, risk um, has increased con considerably. Um, this brings me to the next slide that discuss um, what are the recent threats, threats for the farming sectors. Um, Brexit, global warming, and the Russian-Ukraine war has all increased the likelihood or the risk of uh, farming enterprises to go insolvent. Brexit, because uh, um, it has um, undermined the uh, subsidies that farmers received before. Now, the UK has introduced a different subsidy system. Uh, this is not equivalent to the one that we had before, so it reduces the amount of support that the farmers uh, um, receive. Similarly, um, with global warming, this increases the climatic risk, the um, environmental risk, so that, um, as we saw this year, there's been a lot of rain, uh, lambing has been postponed or suspended. Um, we have issues with crops. Uh, so it, the global warming is probably the most uh, uh, clear uh, threat to um, agriculture. But similarly, the Russian-Ukraine war has increased the cost of fuel, fertilizer, and feed, and this has um, effect of the on the cost of the farming um, businesses. So as we see, this um, in, in the recent year, the um, input cost have increased and the support uh, has been reduced and the risk of global warming has increased. So the picture of uh, the farming sector is not the best at the moment. Um, what uh, I found out in my research is that uh, the number of insolvency in the sector is definitely increasing. As I said, there, there have been quite a recent uh, threats that um, 
you can see the effects of these recent threats in the uh, insolvency of the um, pharma sector. You can see the red uh, line is corporate, so farmers organized in um, uh, company and individual instead concerns individual farmers and a partnership. The numbers are lower for individual partnership, individuals and partnership. However, there are a lot of farms that escape the numbers because they do not approach the, insol the formal insolvency procedures, but they uh, attempt to restructure or they, win they close uh, without a liquidation procedure. Now, uh, the findings of my um, interviews uh, reveal that um, one of the challenges, uh, the, the pictures that we have is that the debtors have various legal form. We said that they may access um, personal or corporate insolvency proceedings. Um, and uh, that the main difference among farmers concern the ownership of the land where Landowners have always a backup security of the land. So when they um, ask for a mortgage or when they ask for money, they always have the security um, that if the bank wants to um, the money back, they can sell the land. Um, while tenant farmers don't have this um, privilege. Uh, and in terms of creditors, uh, we know that uh, the farmers creditors are mostly banks. Uh, suppliers of the 3S, so feed, fertilizer, and fuel, and higher purchase agreement providers, for example, for large machinery used in, uh, um, in agriculture. Um, what uh, has emerged from the interviews with the consultant is that most often than not, the um, insolvency or the financial distress of farmers is dealt by um, farmers consultant through informal workouts with the major creditors, so mainly with the banks. Now, if we look at the challenges of farmers in financial distress, um, what the interviewees has communicated, has uh, uh, generally identified, is that uh, um, farmers are getting older, there is an aging population in farmers, and they have uh, and there is limited uh, to NOVA. Uh, this cause may cause a lack of innovation in the business structures. And once we are in a financial uh, distress situation, then we have to consider issues such as the emotional attachment to the business, which often is intergenerational. So we have multiple generations of farmers uh, that have dealt with the same business. Um, and then the fact that there is the family home in the uh, business premises. So if we have to sell the land, what do we do with the family home? Do we sell it as well? Do we protect it? Um, do we allow the farmers to lose uh, the family home as well as the main income uh, uh, source? Uh, so oh, these are all the, um, issues that emerge in practice when we deal with farmers insolvency. Um, then more into the details of what issues insolvency practitioners have to face once the insolvency proceedings are open um, are uh, generally the fact that the sale of asset is seasonal dependent. Of course, uh, if you have a llama or a sheep, the value of that asset will change. Um, or if you want to uh, sell uh, carrots, you need to um, wait till the carrots are fully grown. Um, but also the fact that uh, um, during the period in which the insolvency practitioner uh, has to look after the business, they have to deal with livestock, I, I respect in animal welfare regulation. So things that normally will not come up uh, within the duties of the insolvency practitioner in other business sectors. As I said, um, tenant farms are a um, particular risk of, insolvent, of insolvency more than um, land owners um, because of the lack of assets that can secure against uh, um, lending. And the current restructuring tools that we have, for example, if we have an individual farmer um, 
will apply for uh, individual voluntary arrangement. Those include repayments planned for up to five years. They're not always suitable for um, farmers, um, the tenant farmers, because for example, the tenancy agreement may last three years. So there are some inconsistency in, in some difficult um, difficulties between the two um, sectors, between insolvency and the practice of uh, farming. Now, <clears throat> farmers insolvency um, is not a, um, oh, farmers financial distress is not a problem exclusive of the UK, of course. Um, the same problems uh, is everywhere. The causes are uh, the same. Um, but we have some uh, different responses to this problem. Um, I have uh, identified four countries um, and I look at how they deal with financial distress of farmers. I identified the USA, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand because they are all common laws, uh, common law countries, which means that there are, their insolvency law is fairly similar to ours um, and also for a question of language. Now, in the, um, in the US, um, we have different tools to uh, address farmers' insolvency. Uh, in chapter 12, which is a procedure designed specifically for uh, family farmers and fishermen, um, it is a um, reorganization uh, plan procedure. So it's similar to chapter 11, but more simplified. And then we have national debt mediation schemes that are developing in, in countries such as uh, Minnesota or Iowa, um, countries that have uh, a strong uh, um, agricultural sector. And um, they have developed um, mediation schemes that involve the bank as major creditors or the major creditors, for example, the bank um, and the, uh, and the um, farmers to get together before filing for insolvency to discuss a repayment plan. Um, this uh, um, approach has been adopted also in Canada, um, Australia and New Zealand. So these are quite similar approaches. Um, they all include this farm mediation schemes. These uh, basically are um, schemes that allow and uh, they protect the farmer against uh, big uh, um, creditors because they oblige the big creditors, such as bank, to um, apply for mediation before going officially to court. And the mediator offers support um, to the farmer, so to um, make a more level playing field across the two actors. So if we look at the benefits of, uh, uh, sorry, let me see. Um, if we look at the benefits of uh, um, the, these depth mediation schemes, is that they allow um, a consultant, farm consultant, to develop a rescue plan. So we have the expertise of farm consultancy involved in the debt mediation. It is confidential, so it's not uh, um, out in the public as it is for the formal insolvency proceedings. And it, is, it saves the cost, uh, the legal costs related to the procedures. And as I said before, um, it tries to rebalance the power dynamics between this great um, powerful creditors and the uh, farmers, which may have different size and different uh, power, um, contractual power. Uh, now, my study would like to um, suggest that we could uh, propose a legal transfer on this uh, topic so that we could introduce a debt mediation scheme um, in the UK as well um, for farmers so that we could employ the current expertise of farming consultants 
But um, together with a procedural stay, which is typical of insolvency law, so that allows insolvency, uh, that allows the um, debtor to have a pause before being attacked by different creditors. So we have a stay, a moratorium, to allow the consultant to develop the plan, the restructuring plans. And it fosters more um, balanced um, power between the parties because the um, mediator will support the farm. Um, now, considering the global warming, considering, considering the need of food that we have and considering uh, the challenges that we are currently facing, um, it, will be in, it is interesting for me to further develop this and see um, how this idea of legal transfer will be um, be adopted in this uh, country. So I think I managed to stay on time. Excellent, good stuff, Oriana. Absolutely fantastic research. Truly mean that. Thank uh, you. So then, I'll. We haven't got any questions in the chat log as of yet. So I think I'll I'll get things started with a with a question from me then if. Uh, if you don't mind. Yes. Um, I, I know your interviews have been with consultants at, at this stage so far, but I was, I was just wondering in, in the future, is, is there potential to interview farmers themselves around financial distress? Because yes. as you've mentioned with the external threats currently facing the farming industry, right now we've got the removal of the European subsidies. Yes. Looking at England, we've got the transfer of many farmers into the new environmental land management schemes. I've spoken to many farmers about this. Is, is there any plans on the horizon to yes. farmers around this? Yes, thank you. So I just want to clarify, in the interviews, the majority of the interviewees were um, cons farmers consultants. Mm -hmm. I managed to talk with um, bank representatives, so somebody that deals uh, uh, from the bank side that was also very useful, uh, but mostly I've dealt with professionals. Uh, yes, next stage will be to talk with farmers as well and to see um, how they perceive their financial distress and what, uh, and if they think that something like this could be useful. Because mm. uh, I think it's also quite uh, um, cultural dependent. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, it will be interesting to see if a farmer will accept a mediator in supporting mm -hmm. them in managing their uh, their financial distress. So that's definitely a step that is necessary before for the uh, proceeding further with the project. Yeah, absolutely. And it'll be, be interesting to hear the, the boots on the ground responses for, from the farmer point of view. Um, so we've got some questions coming in from the chat log and now, so I'll go to Claire James who has asked, did the insolvency practitioners give you any sense if there was a particular cause for the recent increase in insolvency, and did they have any opinions on the new environmental land management schemes and how that might impact insolvency? Thank you. Uh, so yes, only one interviewee mentioned it, and it was from a charity dealing with farmers' distress. Not financial, but mostly financial, it turns out. Um, so um, the causes, and I see also the, the second question um, is on the same, the, the following question is on the same uh, topic. So uh, no, the uh, interviewees did not uh, talk about what are the causes, what in, in their opinion are the causes. but. Um, Basically, um, for insolvency is always, we have more um, liabilities that we can afford basically than assets. Um, for uh, farmers with land, that problem is solved by selling the land. So you sell back the land, you sell the land to the bank, the bank, you don't have the debt with the bank, but this is not necessarily a good thing because a farmer with la without land cannot do much. So then we have a problem of how that business will work without that piece of land. And the other reason because of uh, why the farmers, uh, are, the numbers are increasing is because of the increase of a cost. So we know that we don't have the fuel costs more, the feed costs more, um, the fertilizer costs more. So these are input costs. 
If we increase those and we reduce the amount of money that they get with the subsidies, uh, then we will have an uh, uh, imbalanced balance sheet. Um, so I hope that answered the question. On the uh, schemes, now they did not have uh, an opinion on the schemes, but um, from my understanding also to, from other conferences I attended is that the two systems are not equivalent. So there are there is a percentage, I don't know how, how big, but there is a percentage of farmers that will be left out from the necessary support that they were, were receiving before necessary to avoid insolvency. Very good. Um, you know, you, you picked up on a number of really interesting points. I, I, I like uh, in your presentation as well, you identified the, the importance of different business legal structures within the yes. industry too. So sole trader and partnership being the two most uh, common um, with, with limited being the least. Yes. Right? And uh, um, one insolvency practitioner confirmed that the insolvency of partnership is particularly complex because uh, we don't have the separation of personality that we have in a company. So if you are a farmer and you own, if you, if you own, a, if you own shares in a company that does farming, if the company goes insolvent, then the company closes and you don't have any problem personally. But if you, have, if you are in a partnership with your brother and you are a, a farm in the land, then if something happens, and this often happens, that there is a family structure and family tensions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You bring those into an insolvency procedure that is already um, not easy, is not very well structured. So um, the complexities are everywhere, I would say. Yeah, to say the least, <laughs> um, absolutely. And uh, did you did you look at uh, different agricultural subsectors? Is there any nuances there? Because I know different. Oh, I haven't. I haven't looked specifically. Um, I know that um, one interviewee uh, suggested that um, business, well, less diverse businesses are of course more at risk of insolvency. Uh, mm -hmm. If you only um, have one type of animal um, and you don't deserve diversify, more likely uh, you are more at risk. But also um, the businesses that are mostly um, involved in food production mm -hmm. because of the, we know of the power dynamics with uh, big supermarkets and the uh, prices. So if the prices are below uh, cost, that also uh, has a big risk. It's a big risk of not ending their year in uh, positive. No, absolutely. Um, yeah, no, subsectors could be interesting as well, with, uh, especially when looking at upland and farmers in less favourable areas who can be dependent upon subsidies for up to 90% of their annual business income. Yes. And, um, and, to, and to access the new subsidies, they will have to make changes that may cost money. Mm -hmm. So it's um, it's a bit of a, sn a snake a snake that bites his own uh, tail. I don't know how you say it in English, but um, you have to give farmers money if you want them to be sustainable, not vice versa. It, it cannot be a condition. It needs to be an end goal, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, but the research is not on the schemes, so I don't wanna uh, I don't wanna spend too much on that. Right, no problem. Yeah. Excellent. Well, we shall call this to a close then, but thank you so much, um, Oriana, for your uh, for your time. It, it was great hearing. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, it was lovely. Yeah. And uh, I'll, I'll call this session to a close then. Thank Fantastic. You thank you.